All right. So um, this discussion then looks at, looks at the way that the war is being fought, and it's going to look ahead to the next uh, half of the course when we get into Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Uh, okay. And so I have called this postmodern war, and why? And so this is a discussion of that. So um, I'll give you a chance to write the stuff down if you like, or type it out, or take a screenshot of it. <laughs> While I have some tea from my Snow White mug, you'll see. There she is, Snow White. Um, Okay, so this is the first section, obviously, duh, <laughs> the coming revolution in military thought. The way that uh, the 21st century wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are being fought and have been fought for the last oh, 18 years in the case of Afghanistan um, are in large part a response to the Vietnam War, which just makes sense. It just makes sense that the next time you would hope that next time you arrive at a situation which is similar, where you're fighting a guerrilla force, uh, which uh, ebbs and flows, and which you um, you don't they don't engage in stand up battles, and they they engage in uh, they use the so they disappear into the civilian population and all that stuff. You would hope that you wouldn't go back with exactly the same expectations that you went in with in Vietnam, which is. Uh, military tactics learned from uh, World War II and Korea. And one of the old criticisms that's leveled at war departments uh, everywhere is that they uh, are fighting, they prepare for the next war by, by fighting, the, by looking at the last one. So basically, you know, you prepare for World War II by, by looking back to World War I. And this is the problem, for instance, the, probably the best example of that would be the Maginot Line where the French were like, well, we'll never be, you know, we'll never be taken again uh, by surprise by the Germans like that. We'll build a, you know, a fortress, a line. And they did, you know, and then the Germans got to it. They just rolled right through it. They're like, we're, <laughs> this is, this is a whole different thing, baby. You know, we're, Achtung, <laughs> baby, as the song says, you know, we're, <laughs> we're not stopping here. We're going right through to Paris. Um, so this is the same kind of thing. So what can we take away from Hare's text overall? Um, and he survives, so pardon me, he describes the survivor in a postmodern war as being, he says, a moving target survivor subscriber, a true child of the war, because every, except for the rare times when you were pinned or stranded, the system was geared to keep you mobile, if that was what you thought you wanted, on page eight. So let me go back to this again, because it's quite poetic, right? So a moving target survivor subscriber. So basically, you understand yourself to be a moving target, and but you're also a survivor. Like this is what makes you a survivor, you believe. You know, you, you keep moving. If you keep moving, you can't be killed. So you subscribe to that. You're like, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm on. I'm, I'm, bring it, you know, that's, that's me. I, I'm gonna keep on moving. And so a true child of the war, because the war is, uh, as I talked about, especially by the late 60s, really uh, fixated or, or signified by, Air, mobi air mobility and the helicopters. Um, because except for the rare times when you were pinned or stranded, uh, so what is, like, let's say he's pinned down at Quezon, or you get stranded somewhere, you know, presumably out in the boondocks where, uh, you know, you, you can't get a helicopter. So you're like, oh, you're waiting. You got to wait for a day, two days to get a helicopter that'll fly in for resupply. And then you can go out on the empty helicopter. He says, the system was geared to keep you mobile, if that's what you thought you wanted. So that, you know, the, and this is the astonishing thing about this particular war. And as I say, it will never, I mean, maybe it'll be repeated. Now, now of course, with drones, it's a whole different game. Um, but the idea is that basically people can, can move around, can shuttle around the war zone in ways that just were unthinkable before this. And, um, okay. So how might we define postmodern war? All right. Well, I'll give you four, four, count them, four different things. First, is that the war puts emphasis, and we saw this in Go Tell the Spartans, on information dominance, where uh, Asa, Major Barker, um, is working with the World War II Korea 
uh, worldview, military worldview, which is basically that you know what's happening because you're on the ground. Um, you, you get on the ground, you get intelligence, and you're, you stay connected to people and you listen to people. But the idea that information dominance, and here, remember, I showed you pictures of those big rooms full of, of machinery, called, which I called Big Iron, the IBM 36370. These are the machines which are going to be used to run statistical models of what's happening. And so that's why it's so important to have the army guys come in and say, uh, oh, you know, we're going to put up a information, information was incident flow chart, uh, incident, incident flow indicator, you know, which it is, it's the, this is, is the new way of fighting war. And this is indeed what has taken over. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. And the guy with his, uh, I will have mentioned this, but the guy with his flow charts and his slide rule will say, uh, when one of the guy, one of the admins in the office says, uh, you know, World War II, and he says, what's that? He says, that's what I call him, World War II, because he basically has, his, he's stuck as far as they're concerned in World War II. Uh, okay, that leads to the second, so information dominance, that leads to the second thing, which is that a privilege is very high technology. Now, typically, the highest of the high technology is going to come from the Naval Air Force. Uh, and that is true, um, but the ground troops will be part of this um, because there are different service arms in the military. So there's the Army, which we think of as being ground. So they do stuff like they've got infantry and they've got tanks and there's artillery and so on. That's all army, we think. And then there's the people who fly. Okay, that's Air Force. And the people who are on water, Navy. Right? But remember that the people who are on water, the Navy, have these big aircraft carriers, right? And with these aircraft carriers, they're carrying aircraft. Well, the aircraft they're carrying are not the Air Force. They're the Naval Air Force, right? They are Navy pilots who fly off aircraft carriers and fly back to aircraft carriers and are Navy fundamentally. So the Navy is must, because it's doing all this compl incredibly complex stuff, have, it, it, it is very interested in super high technology because it wants to make these aircraft carriers fly, work better with the machines and fly better. And the, so the Naval aircraft is, uh, the, one of the most complex pieces of technology you're going to have, and so on. So high to high technology, which will come to be located in the Navy. Um, but the Army and the Marines and other forces won't be hard, far, far behind. And then uh, what there is, and this is, this, this is something that began in World War II, where increasingly uh, you put machines out front and you take people off the battlefield when you can. And the American, um, <clears throat> it's interesting the way that say the Germans de de developed tanks in World War II and the way the Americans developed tanks. The Americans developed relatively underpowered tanks in World War II compared to the German tanks, which were these incredible, nearly indestructible things. Um, especially the ones that appeared towards the end of the war where they were just I mean, they were, they were extremely powerful pieces of armor. Um, and the Americans had uh, lots and lots of armor on the battlefield, but it wasn't very strong. So what the, American began, the Americans began to do was say, effectively, we'd rather have people in machines and protected than people on the battlefield. And after a while, like, we would rather have just machines on the battlefield. And so this, again, goes back to this discussion about, well, what do you value? You know, and so the Vietnamese had people, so they had to put people forward in battle. And people got slaughtered in trem at tremendous rates. But the Americans had machines, so they put machines forward. And uh, the crews had what was considered to be the best equipment at the time. Didn't mean it was the greatest equipment, but it was the best for the time. Um, but the Vietnamese didn't have that kind of equipment. So this is the technological push that's going on. And the fourth thing is that uh, postmodern war believes in speed and flexibility and mobility. 
And these, four, these three things will be absolutely crucial when we arrive in the 21st century. So, uh, you know, you need to just sort of keep your, your eye posted on these things. So what are these four things? Again, they're, they're just to, re to review um, very briefly. So the first thing is information dominance. The second thing is privilege is high technology. The third thing is puts machines out front, takes people off the battlefield. And the fourth thing is speed, flexibility, mobility. Okay. 